Let's talk about graphs. Graphs are like trees, except in one really important way, which is that when you start at some node and traverse the edges, you might get back to the node you started from. In other words, they might have cycles. Now, graphs are all around us. For example, here's a highway map. Here, the vertices are cities, and the edges are the highways that connect them. Now, highways, of course, are bidirectional, meaning that if you can go from one city to the other, you can usually come back in the opposite direction just as well. Here's another graph, and this is an airline route map. Now, airlines also typically run bidirectional routes, though to some more obscure places, they might force you to go in a longer path to get from one place to the other than to get back. Here's another one. This one is a representation of the connectivity of the internet from its earlier days. Now, one more graph that is all around us these days is the social networking graph, where the nodes are people and the edges are relationships between people, such as friend relationships. Now, the social graph is most certainly not bidirectional in that some people have lots of friends, many people have few friends, and just because one person friends the other, the other person might not return the favor. Therefore, in general, we prefer to think of graphs as being directed, meaning there is a direction to the edge between two vertices, and an undirected graph simply becomes a directed graph that has edges in both directions between the vertices. In this course, we're going to focus on directed graphs because we can always construct undirected graphs out of them if we need to. Let's now study how we might represent graphs. We'll start with a very simple representation and then work our way up to a much more sophisticated one. So here's the first of our four representations. In this representation, we'll assume that a vertex is simply represented by a string. For example, the name of a city or the name of a person. And the representation is simply a list of edges. So we have a type that represents an edge. And a graph itself is simply a list of these edges. With this representation, let's try to create a little sample graph. Here I've defined G, which is a graph of the major cities in New England. Remember that we're representing directed graphs, so if I want to talk about cities that are connected to each other, then I need to have an edge in each direction. Once we have a representation like this, we can start to write functions over it. A really useful function is one that provides the neighbors of a given node in the graph. So in this case, the neighbors of function is going to take the name of a city and it's going to take a graph and compute all the cities that have that city as a neighbor. The code is what you'd expect. It takes a city name and then it filters out all of the edges that refer to that city name as the starting point and then we map the destinations of that city to obtain all of the neighbors. If we run this on our sample graph, here's a test case. The neighbors of the city Providence in this particular graph are the cities Worcester and Boston. And when I run this, we find that the test does indeed pass. So that's a very simple representation where we simply have a list of edges where each vertex on the edge is a string. Now this is a very nice and easy representation, but it does have a bunch of problems. For one thing, we don't have the ability to store very much interesting information about the vertices, for example, the populations of the cities or something else about them. We also have to repeat the names of these cities over and over again. So if we, for example, happen to misspell a city in one particular place, we wouldn't find it as a neighbor, even though it very obviously is. So we'd like a representation that doesn't have quite these problems. This takes us to our second representation, which I will call a keyed graph. In a keyed graph, we're going to have an actual data structure that represents a node, and then a graph itself is a list of nodes instead. So the adjacency, the information that was in the edges, is now stored with the nodes instead. Here's our data structure representing a keyed node. It's a parametric type because there could be any kind of interesting data inside the, key, inside the node, but we have a key which is a string that names the vertex so that we can refer to it from other places. And then the ones that are adjacent to this particular node 
is simply a list of strings that are the keys of the other cities or the other nodes. The graph itself then simply becomes a list of these keyed nodes. Let's now construct an example of this representation. So here's the same graph that I had before. As a key, I'm now using the airport codes of these cities. Everyone in the world, of course, knows that Worcester's airport's code is ORH, PVD is Providence, and BOS is Boston. For the datum, I'm simply recording the name of the city, though I could have more interesting data there. And notice that the adjacencies are referring to the keys. So for example, Providence's adjacent neighbors are ORH and BOS, not Worcester and Boston as they were before. Now, if I want to compute the neighbors of a city in this representation, if I take a city name um, through its key, I'm going to have to first find the node that represents that city and then find its neighbors. Here's the code that does that. Notice this little helper function, find city by key, which has to go through the graph and find the node that actually corresponds to that key and then it can compute using the information in that node. So having this key provides us an extra level of indirection, which in this case is actually a bit of a nuisance because we have to keep going to find the cities that correspond to the key before we can process them. Finally, we should write a test case to make sure that we haven't actually changed anything. Here it is. It's the same test we had before. And when I run through this representation, we're going to find that we get the same answer once again. So we now have a second representation. This one focuses on the nodes rather than on the edges. It allows us to store complex information for each node, but it does have the disadvantage that we have to keep going and looking up these cities through this other search loop, in this case, find city by key, which is a nuisance and also reduces the performance of this representation. This problem with looking things up might suggest a third representation. In this case, instead of having a string that we have to keep looking up, perhaps instead we could use something like a vector and we could simply reference things by their indices in the vector. That would at least give us constant time lookup for the cities. Let's look at that representation. This time we have an indexed node. An indexed node, again, is parametric over what kind of data it holds. And it has an adjacency list, but now it's just a list of numbers. Observe that the index node doesn't actually have a number that tells us its index because it derives its index by virtue of being in some other vector. So here is our data type for the index graph. The index graph is just a vector of index nodes. And now instead of a string naming each node, we just have a index in the graph that tells us what its quote unquote name is. Let's make an example of the datum. It looks an awful lot like what we had before, except now we have a vector and we no longer have to repeat the names and come up with these artificial names for these nodes. Except notice that we've just replaced one artificial name with another because now the adjacency list for Providence is one and two, which happens to mean Worcester and Boston because of the positions in the vector, but that's not at all intuitive. But still, let's go and see how we can write programs with this. Let's go back and write our function neighbors off. And here is neighbors of. Neighbors of again takes an index and a graph, and it walks over the graph and constructs the neighbors. This time it doesn't have to go searching for the city based on a string because it can simply use the vector dereferences to find the appropriate cities. And so we should test this, and here's our test case again. It looks almost exactly like what we had before, except instead of having the index, instead of having a name for a city, we have to refer to it by index, in this case zero, and once again, we get the same answer. So we've seen three different representations. The first was edge-centric, the next two were node-centric, and in node-centric ones, we looked at two different ways of trying to refer to other nodes, but both of them are, at the very least, clunky. We have to construct these artificial names, in one case a string, in another case we introduce a vector and we talk about positions in the vector. And if you look at the example graph, there's nothing intuitive at all about how we've written it. What we'd really like to be able to say is that the nodes that are adjacent to the node representing Providence are the nodes representing Worcester and Boston. We just want to name the nodes directly.
We don't want to have to create artificial indices for them. And this sounds like a job for shared. Let's see how that works out. Finally, here's our fourth representation. We'll start by defining the type for a node. A node is a polymorphic container. It has some data of type alpha, and it has an adjacency list, which is a list of nodes. Now this data type should look a little familiar from the uh, representation we wrote down earlier for lazy lists in that there doesn't seem to be anything that uh, intervenes between the node and other nodes. There's no lambda, but neither is there any kind of base case. In other words, it's the same kind of cyclic data structure that we saw earlier for lazy lists. Now, once we have our data type for a node, a graph is simply some collection of nodes. In this particular case, we've used a list. We could as well have used a vector or something else. But the important thing here is that nodes don't have any identifying information such as a name, nor do they have something like a position in a vector that gives them some external means of reference. Rather, a node is itself, and its existence, its identity, is all that matters. This should also be familiar to you from our discussion of eek, namely, if we have two different nodes, the fact that they're in different positions and therefore have different eeks is all we need to tell them apart. We don't also need something like a vector reference or a string name to tell the nodes apart. Now that we've defined this data type, let's make a sample instance. Let's again create one of those graphs that talked about the cities of New England. The graph looks like this. It's a list of three values. The values are those bound to PVD, ORH, and BOS, where each of those is a name that is bound to a node representing Providence, Worcester, and Boston. Now, we do have to talk about the other nodes in the list of adjacencies, so we have a list that has, for example, ORH and BOS for Providence. But ORH and BOS are just local names inside the shared expression that refer to these two other nodes. In other words, the node for Providence is directly referring to the other two nodes in the shared data structure. It isn't going through some vector index or through some string lookup procedure at runtime. It's referring directly to those node values, which in turn are referring back to it. Now that we have this representation, let's look at the implementation of the same function, neighbors off. Neighbors off is again going to take some representation of a city and a graph in which to find its neighbors. But this time, we don't need to pass it a vector index or a string that represents the city. Rather, the node is the representation of the city. It doesn't need some additional name. And here's the perhaps slightly surprising implementation of neighbors off. Because the node already refers to all of its neighbors, we simply need to map the node data function over the adjacency list of the city node. And that's it. Now we should write our test again. Here it is. And when we run it, we find that we get the same output as before. So this representation using shared is extremely powerful. We no longer have to go through artificial names to get to values. We simply refer to the values themselves. This is what we've been doing all along. But it was problematic once we start to have shared references, and in particular cyclic references, because there was no way to construct the cycles. We saw one way of doing it, using thunks to delay the evaluation, but shared gives us a much more direct way of doing it. So when we need to ask for a node's neighbors, for example, they're right there. We don't have to first evaluate a thunk to get to that list. So this is the representation we're going to be using for the next few classes as we work through graph algorithms.